Do you hear us? Yes, yes. Wonderful. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, so Yu Ting Wei is an assistant professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, and she's going to give the last talk of this morning's session. Um, can you share Recording your screen? Recording in progress. Can you share your screen? Yes, you can. Okay, we see your slides. So yeah, just uh, take it away. We'll have about 20 minutes for your talk and then five minutes for questions, okay? Okay, yeah, sure. Um, hello, everyone. I want to first thank all the organizers for inviting me and for putting up together this wonderful workshop. Um, I really wish I could be there in person with you, but I'm sure that we will have a chance to meet each other in person soon in the future. Okay, so the talk, the plan of my talk today is to um, discuss a certain type of um, estimators in, in the regression setting and which enjoys a curious multi descent phenomenon. Okay, um, so this is a joint work with my student Yue Li at CMU Statistics, and the details of uh, this, this talk can be found um, in this archive preprint. Okay, as we all know that uh, Deep Neural Networks has found its applications in uh, many science and engineering uh, fields. Um, so in fact, um, uh, it has a range of applications. Um, in fact, it's, um, the, the structure of Deep Neural Networks are not that complicated. So given the feature vector X, we know that um, Deep neural networks applies a sequence of linear and nonlinear transformation to this input, and then output uh, either a label or a regression coefficient. Okay, so over the last couple of decades, people have tried to understand what happened, uh, why this uh, simply simple structure can out, can outperform, um, like can uh, have a super human performance. Uh, the talk by Nikolai just now gave us a very, very nice uh, algorithmic point of view of understanding uh, the performance of neural networks. However, uh, there's still no uh, unified answers to why this neural network performs so well. Uh, however, people have summarized a few key features for um, for uh, for this, uh, this this framework. For example, we know that neural networks are usually largely over parameterized um, in the sense that if you count the number of parameters in use, they often um, exceed the number of observations. And also neural networks are often trained beyond zero training error is obtained. So the reason why pe people prefer larger models or more over-parameterized models than simple models, uh, it is because that in practice, people have observed that larger models often behave much better. For example, uh, this paper by Nakirin et al. in 2019, they carry out a bunch of experiments and shown that if you plot the test error and training error, um, if you increase the number of parameters, there's still benefit in uh, using more and more parameters. For example, in this plot, you can see like the training error always decreases, but the test error first, uh, you, you will like uh, blow up a little bit and then continue to decrease. Okay, so uh, this phenomenon has observed by not only this paper, but uh, a sequence of papers. And people observe that um, it's always uh, much better to use a larger, larger models. So um, this motivates us to uh, ask the question, how, does, how, how do these neural networks manage to generalize, right? Because if you open any uh, book on statistical learning, you will see this classical U-shaped curve where um, it, it tells you that if you increase the capacity of your model and if you plot the training error and test error, at some point, um, increasing the capacity will eventually hurt the generalization error. So you will have this bias and variance trade-off. And more uh, recently, um, it is nicely summarized by Belkin and his co-authors 
as this double descent phenomenon will beyond, uh, before this, um, what they call is interpolation uh, threshold, you still see this U-shape, this classical U-shape generalization curve. But beyond this interpolation threshold, what they call the modern interpolating regime, you can see that as you increase, further increase the capacity, the test error or, uh, or generalization error will further decrease. Okay, so it of course um, conflicts with our uh, our uh, classical statistical wisdom. So it motivates us to study like classical estimators in the modern interpolation uh, interpolating regime when interpolation really happens. Okay. So, so far, the theoretical understandings are still quite limited. Uh, most of the efforts have been focused on this minimum L2 norm interpolators. Um, it is defined as um, the minimum L2 interpolators. They are defined as the minimizer of this reach-like penalty where you take the, um, the pa parameter lambda going to zero and uh, there are a sequence paper which um, sort of analyzed the performance of, of this like, minimum L2 interpolator under the, linear, um, under the linear model. So it has been observed that um, uh, this, even for this very, very simple estimators, it presents this double descent uh, curve where on the left hand side, this is uh, um, the uh, paper by Hasty et al, where they show that the rich list regression for a misspecified linear model will have will present this double descent curve. And on the right hand side, it is uh, uh, a paper by May at Montanari, where they show that this um, very simple estimator um, under a random feature model also also present this double descent um, phenomenon as observed in uh, neural network training. Okay, however, uh, sometimes we know that uh, the L2 norm may not suit the uh, underlying geometry. So you want to know what happened to other inter type of interpolators, right? For example, uh, what happened to this, um, to this uh, LQ mini uh, norm minimizer? The, um, which minimize where the reach penalty is uh, replaced by this LQ norm ball. Okay, so in this talk, I will focus my attention on a particular type of LQ, um, minimum LQ norm solutions, which is the, when Q equal to one. So why we care about the minimum L1 norm solution? We know that the L1 penalty is often used as a surrogate for the L0 penalty to encourage sparse solution. And also because this is a convex penalty, so we can find, uh, we can use a convex algorithm, uh, so uh, optimization, easy optimization algorithm to approximate the solution. And it's, as also Nikolai pointed out, there are many algorithms which, is, which are known to converge to uh, the minimum L1 norm solution. For example, it's known that AdaBoost converge, uh, converges to the minimum L1 solution for linear separable data. And it is also known that some gradient descent algorithm, um, for example, for the matrix factorization problem, will converge to the minimum nuclear norm solution. Okay, and there's also a lot of empirical successes of dropouts and the model pruning in deep learning, where um, if you uh, think about, um, if you train a larger model and sort of trim your model to get a smaller, smaller model, so it is known that uh, in many empirical cases, uh, in many cases, they have a better empirical performances. So, um, the, knowledge, the message that we got from this, this work is that a smaller model may behave um, similar or even better. Okay, so uh, it may not take you long to realize that a minimum L1 solution uh, in the noisiness case 
connects back to the uh, well-known basis pursuit estimator, where um, if you restrict yourself to all the interpolator that like uh, um, have zero training error, so basically the minimum L1 norm solution uh, correspond to the one that has like the minimum L1 norm. Okay, so it's um, it is um, that it is naturally connects to the compressing compress sensing literature that people have like a develop a nice theory about this basis pursuit uh, estimator uh, in the noiseless case. However, in the noisy and over parameterized case, and the natural question is how does generalization error of this estimator depend on the ratio between P over N? Okay, so P is the uh, number of features and N is the number of observations. Okay, so first we carry out a bunch of uh, experiments and trying to know like what happens to this, uh, to, to uh, what, what, what's the performance of this minimum L1 solution. And in our first experiment, we show that, um, so here the axis, x axis is the ratio between P over N and the y axis is the rescaled generalization arrow. And if you uh, take the true signal theta star to be a sparse, as sparse vector where the sparsity is proportional with uh, the number of samples and number of features, and you can see like the performance of minimum L1 solution actually has this like multi-descent phenomenon where it undergoes phases of descent and ascent descent. And then in the end, once you increase uh, the ratio between P of N, it will de decrease to uh, the arrow of a zero estimate. Okay, and similar phenomenon um, happens if you uh, fix the uh, ratio between the sparsity and the number of features. Okay, so in this work, we just want to understand how to theoretically characterize this descent. Okay, so there are a few key challenges. For example, there's no closed form solution for the minimum L1 norm interpolators, unlike what happened to the minimum L2 norm interpolators. And also there's no consistent support recovery in high dimensional regime when uh, the number of sparsity is proportionally with the number of features. And also there's no strong convexity or restricted strongly convexity in this optimization problem. And how do you uh, characterize the, uh, the behavior of this, this um, estimator? Okay, so here are just several key challenges. Okay, so to, before telling you our main result, let me formally set up the, the problem where um, suppose that we consider a simple, a stylized setting where you have a linear model where uh, the observ observation vector y equal to some x times uh, the true parameter theta star plus a noise vector z where the true signal theta star is uh, as sparse and uh, we focus our attention on the proportional regime where the sparsity and the number of features and number of uh, observations, they're all proportionally uh, growing with each other. And uh, we focus our attention on the Gaussian design and Gaussian noise. So this is the simplest setting that, you, uh, that everyone can consider where each row of the X matrix is generated from the IID Gaussian. Uh, vector and the, the noise is also independent Gaussian um, noise. Okay, so under this setting, we consider the asymptotic uh, risk, um, um, the asymptotic risk, where it's defined as um, if you sample a new pair of samples, X new and Y new, from this linear, linear model and you computed the generalization error, which is the expect, uh, expectation of the L2 loss. Okay, so by simple calculation, this, is, this has this form. Okay, and we consider the high dimensional asymptotics uh, where we want to know that as you increase the, uh, uh, the number of features and number of um, observations while keeping their ratio as a constant delta, what happens, um, 
can we characterize the descent of this, this, uh, this risk as a function of delta? Okay, I hope that is clear. Um, all right, so we are not the first one who study uh, this problem. And here is an incomplete list of literature which um, consider the exact asymptotic framework. Uh, there are uh, like beautiful work in, uh, in complex sensing literature, robust regression classification, and also sparse recovery for spike models. Okay, so, okay, now let me state our main result. Um, suppose that for the true uh, signal, suppose each entry of the theta star is generated from this mixture of two distributions, where with epsilon, probability epsilon, it will be equal to some number. This is a, a, just, a, just think about it as a rescaled constant. And with probability one minus epsilon, the theta star i will be equal to zero. Okay, so it's like either it's equal to some constant or uh, equal to zero, just to ensure that we have uh, like a epsilon times p sparsity of our theta star. Okay, so under this assumption, we are able to show that if you increase the ratio between p over n, Okay, so eventually it will, the risk curve will converge to the risk of a zero estimator. So in the limit, will converge to what a zero estimator does. Okay, and also we are able to show that at a given aspect ratio, um, there exists some uh, sparsity ratio epsilon where the risk will decrease with P over N and this, um, at this, this ratio in the sense that if you fix delta, okay, consider a fixed PN ratio, uh, eventually the curve will have a negative slope at that point if you decrease your sparsity level epsilon. Okay, and what's more, we can show that around one and around infinity, there will always be a negative slope. Okay, and uh, uh, also, if you uh, consider, uh, uh, consider a fixed SNR, um, then if you decrease the uh, sparsity level, there will always be a regime where you have an increasing phase. Okay, so we're able to show that here at uh, around one in the infinity, there will always be an active slope, and in the middle, there will be increasing an increasing phase. Okay. So some heuristic explanation about this curve. First, why there's a peak at the interpolation point where P uh, equal to N, as is shown by this nice three-page paper by uh, Pojo et al. in 2020, where they plot just the conditional number of X. And uh, when, you, um, when you consider the conditional number of X, you already see a peak at P of N because the conditional number is not stable at P of n. Okay, so you should always expect a peak at the interpolation point. Okay, and then why you ex should expect it will further increase with P of n? Because for the minimum L1 solution, the, uh, the size of the support will always be equal to n if, you P, uh, if P is larger than n. Okay, so you somehow encourage this sparse solution. So that's why sometimes if your signal is not strong enough, you want to um, recover a sparse solution, then the uh, support, um, the resulting support is actually not correct. So when the resulting support is not correct, it behaves even worse than the zero estimator. So we will have an increasing phase where it's like a worse than the risk is worse than the zero estimate. Okay, so um, so with this, I want to emphasize that because the minimum L1 solution has a nice interplay between over parameterization ratio and the sparsity, so you have a like a richer um, phenomenon. Okay. So compared to the minimum L2 norm interpolator, where people characterize the, uh, can write out the 
the risk explicitly, and you can analyze um, how the risk behave by taking the derivative of delta, which is the NP uh, ratio. Okay, so you can see like the minimum L1 norm solution has a more complicated behavior. Okay, so indeed to prove our result, we resort to uh, the approximate message passing machinery. And due to the time constraint, I will not go into details, but we are able to characterize the risk, risk, behave, uh, risk uh, behavior of the minimum L1 L1 norm solution, which is equal to this tau star, where tau star is a unique solution corresponding to this set of fixed point equations. Due to the time, I will not go into details, but there is a, like, a, these are a closed form solution to this uh, tau star. And by analyzing how tau star um, uh, performs or behaves as a function of delta, we are able to Characterize the ascent and descent of this, this risk curve. Okay, so that's just a high level idea of how do we prove this, this result. Okay, I'm running out of time, but um, you may, um, may not take you long to realize that there are some uh, pedago pedagogical uh, unreasonable things about this curve, right? If you take two points, on two points, one on the left and one, uh, one on the right, they're corresponding to different P and ratio, but on the left, there is a, uh, uh, it corresponding to a bigger num uh, uh, observation, uh, number of observation. So if you can imagine that if you can downsample your uh, data, then you can actually reach a lower generalization risk than the using a bigger data set. Okay, so in this in this paper, in this new uh, archive paper, we are able to uh, show that you can go from a multi descent to a single ascent cur curve by using a cross validation uh, by adapt a cross validation in the higher high dimensional region. Okay, so just to con uh, conclude, uh, we are able to count theoretically characterize descent curve, uh, descent ascent for a minimum L1 norm solution and as future directions. Um, so in our simulation, we see that if you consider a more complicated um, uh, uh, design where the features are, um, uh, the features are generated with general covariance structure, you will see even more uh, oscillations in the risk curve. Uh, there are more uh, phases of ascent and descent. So how do we characterize those? And also um, the uh, theory developed in this work are mainly asymptotic, uh, asymptotic uh, so can we develop non-asymptotic characterization uh, of AMP. And uh, 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 lastly, can we generalize uh, the theory to more complicated model, better explain the performance of neural network? Okay, so uh, with that, I conclude my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. That was very clear. Are there any questions for you, Ting? Yes, Malcolm. Hi, Yutin. Very nice talk. So I, I have a quick question. So one of your results says that as P over N goes large, then the risk of your estimator is the same as the risk of the old zero estimator. Now, I wonder whether this is just the suboptimality of the thing that you're looking at or is this just that the problem is becoming much harder and so anything that you do is the same as basically plugging everything to zero? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I guess like, um, so here, because we focus our attention on the minimum L1 solution, and as P over N goes to infinity, basically uh, the signal to noise ratio, I mean, the signal uh, is like 
so weak, so you cannot do better than a zero estimator. However, um, if you consider, for example, a lasso type estimator and optimize over lambda, so maybe then you can do better than this, yes. Any other questions? And we also encourage all of you who are following on Zoom that you, you know, feel free to share your questions on the chat. Marco is actually following the chat very closely. And so, you know, if you have a question, you can, you can just leave it there and then we'll ask it uh, to the speakers. I think they can also, okay, actually you can also mute yourself apparently. So either way, if you feel, uh, if you have a question, just let us know. <clears throat> Is there anything from the online audience? Not right now. Are there any other questions for you? Too? Is there one? Yeah, go ahead. So, in general, uh, AMP theory is rather flexible to the priors on the signal. So I'm wondering whether this makes it easier for you to analyze something beyond the two-point prior that you've been looking at? Yeah, uh, very good point. So the theory we developed to characterize the risk of this estimator is actually um, does not use the, any of the prior information. So basically this, this result, um, just as long as the, uh, the prior of theta, the theta star goes weakly convert to some distribution, then this, this theor uh, the theorem holds um, whatever. Um, however, to understand to like understand how this tau star um, varies with delta, then we need to plug in the this two point priors so that uh, this uh, fixed point solutions become easier to handle, and then we can you uh, take the derivative and analyze the derivative and second derivative of this fixed point equation to study the um, the the the. Um, um, trend of this risk, yeah. Good. I think at this point we can we can thank you, Ting, for answering our questions and thank you for this very nice talk again. Thanks, everyone.